Welcome to your College Bound Kid. Podcast for parents and families everywhere. Whether you have kids that plan to attend college or you have current college students, you want them in and you want them to graduate. You want a quality education that will give you a skill set that will make you marketable for the jobs of today and the jobs of tomorrow. I am Mark Stucker, and I'm a college coach from Metro Atlanta. And I am Anika Madden, and I am a parent also from Atlanta, currently in North Carolina. And I'm David Williams, and I'm a dad from Chicago, Illinois. This week in the news, an article by Patrick Thomas of the Wall Street Journal, U.S. medical school applicants store in COVID-19 era. Mark and Anika will discuss what are priority deadlines and why are they important. Our bonus content is Mark will discuss why admission directors are so nervous about how many early decision applicants they're going to get this year. Our interview is part one with William Segura, the Associate Dean of Emory, on understanding three models of decision-making for admission committees. And our college spotlight comes to you from Muncie, Indiana, and it is Ball State University. Friends, last week I said I was going to be giving you some bonus content from episodes 145 to 150. Calling an audible. I'm doing bonus content from 142 to 150, starting today. Um, apologies to those who sent questions in from our listener section. We'll resume them at 151. There are just a number of things that are on my heart I want to share with you that are going to impact seniors. So I want to get them to you before admission deadlines. So you'll see for whatever that is, eight, nine straight weeks in a row, instead of a question from a listener, I'm just going to share things that are on my heart. Also, we start a new interview today. I'm very excited about this interview with William Segura, Associate Dean of Admission at Emory. We had some technical issues. In fact, William and I, we actually tried to record six weeks before, and his sound was just off. And I'm like, you know, this sound quality is not great, William. Let's, let's reschedule. So we rescheduled six weeks later, had some similar tech issues. And I said, you know what? We got two sound engineers on our team. We'll give it to them and let them do their best. And they did make it a lot better. But you're definitely going to notice a drop off in sound quality in this interview. But the content is that good that it's worth listening to. I'm just giving you a, you a heads up. Friends, we've got an election coming up, and democracies have to function by people voting. So vote, 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 vote. That's how democracies work. And there are a lot of issues related to higher education that are on the ballot. I encourage you to do some research on higher education and issues and take that in consideration how you vote. Admissions tip. All right. Take a look at all of your deadlines and make a commitment. If a school's got a deadline of January 1st, you should have a goal to turn in everything seven days early. I'll never forget the student named Kyle, who I worked with a long time ago because Kyle's 31 right now. But he had a goal and he consistently did it. Everything he took the deadline, if it was paper due, whatever, he took, he just put seven days before in the calendar. He made that his personal deadline. He turned everything in a week early. Not only is that great discipline, it will relieve a lot of stress. The admission office will appreciate you. And let me tell you, you don't want to be that kid who waits until the last second, has their internet go without, or their computer dies, and thinks you're going to get clemency begging for grace from the admission office. Because you will not get a sympathetic ear. You'll be under a lot of stress. And they'll be like, you didn't have to wait till the last second. You don't want to be that dude or that dudess, if that's such a word. Made it up. So get your stuff in seven days early. All right, Dave, you ready for admissions vernacular? Let's do it. This one you either know or you don't. It's SEEB code. SEEB code. C-E-E-B. SEEB code. Any idea? Mm, I've seen it before, but... Not really. College something. No, I can't remember. So SEEB stands for College Entrance Examination Board. And a SEEB code is a standardized ID that's assigned to every high school, college, or university in the country. So when you're sending test scores, ACT, SAT, or applications, then you have to enter the SEEB code. And so you probably remember it when, you know, with Lauren related to stuff, you just kind of right. forgot because a couple of years ago. But think of it as a social security number for high schools, colleges, and universities. SEEB code. That's right. That's right. I'm going to start making them easier, man. You've, you've been slipping on me. Yes. <laughs> They're being tough. <laughs> <laughs> they were in the double jeopardy round. 
All right. Let's turn to college hot topics in the news. We got an exciting article today that's in your wheelhouse, man. I'm in there in your ter- your turf, your territory today. So take it away, Dave. This is an article by Patrick Thomas of the Wall Street Journal that U.S. medical school applications have soared in the COVID-19 era. According to data from August of this year, medical school applications are up 17%, and that is coming from AMCAS, the Association of American Medical Colleges. And so that means that applications have risen from around low 40,000 to over 50,000 applications this year. And they give four reasons, and we're going to discuss each one of these reasons, Mark. Uh, Number one, COVID spotlights the health professions. Number two, many schools have dropped the AMCATs, at least for this year. Number three, many schools have pushed back the application deadlines. And number four, medicine has always seemed like an attractive, stable career in times of poor or uncertain economies. So uh, let's uh, dovetail back to some of those po- uh, points, Mark. So number one, COVID spotlights health perce- professions. What do you think about that? I friend? think that's a big one. Yeah. Because people are motivated by making a difference and they want to feel like calling, not just a job. They want to feel like, and, and when you see something like COVID and you realize that, wow, maybe I could be involved in, in vaccine research or maybe I could be involved in public health and immunology and what a difference I could make. Right. I think that it's kind of like people feel the call to something now and they realize like how catastrophic this is and all the deaths and wow, I could be a part of something really big. I mean, what do you, what, Dave, you're a doc. You, you know, you, you've been through med school. You've been through this whole process. I mean, I think, I feel like your read on this is better than mine. What do you, what are your thoughts on, on that as a motivation? Well, I, I think COVID has actually lifted the veil on a, a level of complacency that we've had about infectious diseases. For most of human history, our quality of life and our length of life has been defined by diseases going all the way back to leprosy and to smallpox, or when we had a 60, 70% mortality rate, uh, infant mortality rate from things like cholera. And then we, you know, we forget that antibiotics didn't even come into widespread use until after World War II. So we've been in a golden era of infectious disease and all of a sudden COVID hits and it comes as a stunning revelation that we are still very, very, very vulnerable to infectious disease. And in fact, even more so because our societies are so interconnected. So yes, I, I think that that revelation has really spurred people's interest in biomedical sciences and the realization that uh, it, it's a field that's been underappreciated, how much we rely on therapeutics and, and vaccines to actually survive. So it, it certainly has emphasized that point with me as well. So, Yeah, and I hate to admit this, but I just was naive, Dave. Like if yeah. you would have told me that 200,000 people are going to die in this country and, you know, who knows what the final number will be, but what happened? Yeah. You know, I would have probably said something like, man, we had a hurricane that was that bad. Yep. You know? Um, or, you know, Kim dropped a nuclear bomb on us or something. Yeah. Definitely wouldn't have been one of the first three things that came, came to my mind. But when I look back, I was really naive because Bill Gates has been, you know, he, he's been, you know, shouting from the rooftops about something like this could happen. Yes, he has. And, you know, with the work he's been doing on infectious diseases. So I meant my own naivete, but it also does speak to the point you bring up, which is we've kind of been in the golden era for a few decades where we haven't had something this calamitous. Now, I really was naive because, you know, we had SARS and we had Ebola and we had scares. So I shouldn't have been naive, but those never, I guess, permeated my world enough to the point where I was cognizant of this infectious disease thing can come wipe us out. That's right. And, you know, it's interesting. I was reading an interesting History Channel documentary on the plague. And, you know, throughout history, Plagues have been the ones that have shut down 
civilizations and the expansion of empires. And it was emphasizing uh, the role that the Black Plague uh, played in Justinian's empire uh, in uh, Byzantine, uh, uh, the Byzantine area. And he was about to expand through most of Europe and boom, the Black Plague hit and it shut down those expansion in the tracks. And, and in, in a way, we're going back to the plague years, to the concept that a disease can literally bring society, commerce, uh, everything we know about our interactivity to a complete standstill. And, and in the Black Plague, you know, people were fleeing the cities of London and going to the countryside, anything to escape the death that was happening in the cities. And cue New York City and what's happening to the cities today. So, yeah, very, very interesting. Yeah, and I'll just close this section out with a, a quote. This is from Dr. Spann, and it's in the article. And he simply says this, The pandemic has made students aware of the needs we have in healthcare in this country. Yes. So, so yeah, so we both agree the pandemic is a major reason for the surge in med school applicants. Um, That's right. I think your second, was your second reason yeah. was... Uh, many schools going test optional with MCAT. It, it highlighted a couple schools. Uh, it, it talked about Stanford that relaxed the MCAT requirement for this year and saw a 50% surge of its applications. It did make the point, though, that the majority of people that applied still did submit their MCAT, MCAT scores. But nevertheless, there have been more than uh, a number of schools that have relaxed the MCAT requirement for this year because so many people were unable to take it due to the pandemic. Yeah, and I think we shouldn't assume that people know what the MCAT is, Yeah, know how stressful it is. So why don't we talk about that? Just, you know, Dave and I, I think our, our regular listeners know that, you know, we're basically like brothers and we literally talk almost, it's rarely we don't talk in a day. Usually we talk yeah. multiple times in a day. But we were talking yesterday. A lot of people, you, a lot of you may not know this, but Dave works with a lot of doctors and gives a lot of doctors advice and, gives a lot of people advice even related to medical school and things of that nature. But we were talking yesterday um, about the fact that the MCAT's a seven-hour test. And it was like four hours when you took it, wasn't it, Dave? It was. I can't remember how long it was. It certainly wasn't seven hours. But about four or five years ago, when they changed the scoring range from, uh, like it was, the top was 40, and then they changed it so that it goes from like 495 to 528. They extended the length from four to seven hours. So that's a, that's a monster of a test. So the point being is if you can have an opportunity to put in your application and not have to take a seven hour test, that's a pretty good bonus deal. <laughs> I can see why I would be encouraged to put my application in. Well, and let's even go deeper than that. Yeah. So, so MCAT stands for medical, you know, medical college admissions test, right? Yeah. And. Everybody know, going to med school knows that a big part of the decision is your MCAT score. Correct. It's not the only thing, of course. You know, they're going to look at your overall GPA, your biology, physics, chemistry, math GPA. They're going to look at your personal statement, your recommendations, your experiences you've had, and your personal qualities. Yes. So it's not the only thing, but it does count a lot. And a, a low MCAT score will knock you out of contention. So a lot rides on this test. And therefore, it's understandable that if schools go test optional with that, that you'll have a surge in applications. And, and just a couple stats on medical school, just to, uh, I often like in getting into medical school, the competition almost to the degree of competition of being a high schooler getting into a select college. So how tough is it? Well, most individual schools now have less than a 5% admit rate. Now, part of that is due to the fact that the average applicant to medical school makes out as anywhere from 16 to 30 applications. But of those that applied before the surge, about 40% of the applicants to medical school got a spot. So that means 60% of people did not get into medical school. And of those admitted students, the average GPA was 3.7. And the average score on the MCAT for admitted students was in the 88th percentile. So, Mark, we can make that correlation on the SATs and the uh, ACTs. What's an 88th percentile approximately on the SATs or ACTs? Uh, it's about a 28 ACT. 
28 you know, ACT. 28 yeah. ACT and, you know, around a 1300 SAT. Yeah, so that's 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 some pretty tough admit criteria. And it appears that of your two uh, hard criteria, most commentators on medical school admissions have tended to feel that the MCAT is the most important hard score followed closely by your GPA. So uh, it, that just gives a context as to why schools relaxing the MCAT requirement could be such an attractive uh, quality in, uh, incentivizing applicants to put in an application this year. I mean, I still have memories of this. You know, somebody that we've never we've never mentioned on the podcast yet, Dave, but Dave's got an older sister named Ann, who's also a doctor. Right. And I have memories, you know, um, I practically spent a year of my life in Dave's home because I just had a bed there and Aunt Rosie and Uncle Alden there, anytime you want to come. And so I'd live in their home. I really would go there for weeks in the summer. I have memories of Ann, like just spending hours and hours and hours and hours studying for that MCAT. Well, that, that was, that was my memory too. Uh, I, I got to admit that when I was doing research on the MCATs and research on the various uh, study guides and techniques for the MCATs, I started to find myself hyperventilating. It was bringing back bad memories. <laughs> <laughs> Dave told me that. I'm like, wow. I'm like, wow. It's like 30 years later and he starts hyperventilating, remembering the stress yeah. of the thing. 30 years later, I'm like, seven hours? Are you kidding me? <laughs> 88 percent. So I got to study. <laughs> oh, you know what? I always, I always saw you as the guy that just went in and aced the test without studying. So you've had me fooled oh, there, man. No, 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 no one aces without study. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't exist. <laughs> but the point is, the point is, people will oftentimes, you know, um, take a year off, and the same is true for the LSAT. Yeah, you know, which is your law entrance exam. Yeah, people will often take a year off. Um, after undergrad, and you know they'll do some service and some things like that to beef the resume up a little bit. But the but the almost the main purpose of that year is to study for the MCAT. It is, and there's all these courses up. And so the point is, you know, this is a high stress, high stress thing. And if you can have that relieved, I know how many students I work with every year. You know, three to five that that are interested in BSMD programs. Yeah. Uh, these are programs where you're automatically accepted into med school. You go from a bachelor's right into med school, all part of one acceptance process. And and what is one of the biggest reasons they want to do that? They don't want to have to deal with taking an MCAT and having to gain admission into med school. Right. And so anyway, I think we've hit this point well enough, Dave. But the point being, med school apps have surged. And one of the reasons are, is the pandemic. Another reason is the MCAT. Uh, what was your third reason again? Many schools have pushed back the application deadlines. Now, this one was uh, less clear. It, it is true that many schools have pushed back the application deadlines to November or December. But upon further research outside of this article, you have to understand, to me, that's not as significant because many schools are still having rolling uh, admissions. And Mark will understand. Yeah, I think this is a minor factor, too. I really right, do. Right. Because, yeah. you know... you. you Look, it's such a big commitment to want to go to med school for right. four years of your life and maybe even more if you want to be a specialist. I don't think you're all of a sudden, oh, I'm going to be a doctor now because because the school pushed this deadline back a month or 15 days. Exactly. So to me, that was a little flimsy reason. And the point is, there's still a huge premium, especially for medical school, on getting your application in extremely early. In fact, most commentators seem to feel that the number one mistake that students made in not getting into medical school was putting their application in late because the interview schedule is a rolling one. So they might have a, an interview date in late August or late September or late uh, December or January. So even if the application deadline is pushed back and you apply then, you're still missing out on those early interview deadlines. And by missing out, you're actually uh, applying then for fewer and fewer spots because by time, if you're in the later interview sessions, a lot of the med school spots have already been assigned. Does that make sense, Mark? No, it makes a lot of sense. Right, right. So I, I don't want people to think who's applying to medical school, oh, great, I have an extra couple months and it's not going to hurt me. No, it will hurt you. So 
ignore that third part is the point in, in my opinion. Yeah, and keep in mind, friends, like, you know, I know I'm the admissions guy, but I don't do medical, medical school yeah. stuff. I don't do law school stuff. I, I mean, I do have some people with their essays and some interview prep, but that's about it. Yeah. Um, I don't do this. I mean, Dave knows this process much, much better than I do. And he's, you know, the one who's helped more people in this area than I have. So he's kind of in his wheelhouse and he knows his stuff. So I'll defer to Dave as the expert on this one. Yes, yes. So and get your applications in in June. <laughs> There's a saying, June is great, July is okay, August is bad, and anything else, you are just playing with the house money, baby. <laughs> Don't do it. There you go. And what was our last point, Dave? <laughs> Medicine's a stable career, and that is always going to be attractive in a time of economic uncertainty. So, I mean, we saw the same thing happen in 2007. If you time it with every single recession, what better way to sort of uh, sit out a recession than to go to medical school and have a quasi-guaranteed good middle-class lifestyle at the end of the uh, rainbow? So that, 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 I think, is a big issue. Yeah, and I think in some ways, this is, you know, this is coming full circle. This is kind of related to our first issue, which is sort of feeling the calling that you can make a difference. So right. and this is sort of sort of saying, you know what? There are always going to be sick people. There's, I see potential for job security there. Now, Dave and I have talked about how the medical field's changing, Absolutely. and he does a lot of consultation work with people to help them to understand what they're going into if they're going into med school. Um, you know, we haven't talked a lot on here, Dave, about sort of your consultation work and helping people in this process, but you're always helping people understand the, the medical field options. But and we know it's changing, but you can see how people could e easily make deduce that, right? I mean, people are always sick. People are always getting older. There's some job security there. At least right. that's going to be the perception. Although there, the caveat that you always have to make is please don't go into medicine for the financial reasons. Because if you actually do a financial analysis of opportunity costs, in other words, the opportunities that you give up and the salary that you give up in the time it takes you to get through medical school and to get through residency, you will find that even in times of economic uncertainty, there's often fields that are more lucrative or as lucrative in the long run than medicine. So while this is might be a factor for people choosing medicine, it's never a good reason to choose medicine if that is your only reason. So a little And I want to go there. a step further. Yeah. That's never a reason to choose anything. Yeah. I've met so many, I'm mean, I hate to pick on a sector here, but I've met so many miserable people in Wall Street jobs. Yeah. Because they didn't realize that, man, they own me. Yeah. And it's a 14 hour gig, you know? Yeah. Like one of, one of my former admission colleagues, he ended up leaving admissions to go to Georgetown Law School. And then he got a, a Wall Street gig and I was talking to him. He's like, Mark, it's seven to nine. And if we're in the middle of a project, I got to work an eight hour, eight to 10 hour day on a Saturday. Right. Like my young daughter's not going to see me. No. Nope. So he said, I invested all that money in law school and the pay is great, but I'm looking for some other opportunities that they just don't own me for all these hours. And so if you, if you're doing something that many hours of your day and it's not enjoyable, your life's going to be pretty miserable. So I always tell people, find the, try, find the sweet spot between what you love and what you're good at. And most of the time, there'll be a market out there for it. If they're, you know, but even better, the sweet spot between what you love, what you're good at, and there's a market out there for it. And, you know, I'm not naive. You can take a look at lifestyle a little bit and, and see, you know, you know, what's the potential for earnings. I'm not saying it can be, be completely ignorant of that. But a lot of times if you love it and you're good at it, you can make it work for you, whether you become an expert and you develop great speaker fees or whatever. So I think that applies. I don't think I know that applies to more than just medicine. Do what you love and listen to those around you, too. A lot of times those around you will give you really good feedback about what you're good at. Right. And you should be able to identify what you love. Dave, you wanted to say something on that. Yeah. And the last warning I would give for everybody going to medicine is right now, Mark, you and I have discussed it. This. this is the time for a different discussion. But I'll just say that medicine, the medical field, is undergoing fundamental structural change. 
that is going to radically affect the compensation and the lifestyles of many medical fields. It has to do with market forces, supply and demand, the political forces that are pushing us towards different reimbursement structures. But all I'll I get my teledoc is, stock. I, that <laughs> is right. That's one reason. <laughs> but all I can say is for all you prospective doctors, be warned that remember you're looking at an eight to 10 year timeline, you know, four years of medical school, four years of undergrad, an unknown three to seven years of residency. What we see in the medical market right now is going to be radically different in 10 to 12 years time. And we can only guess at one of those, what those changes will be, but those changes will be quite fundamentally profound. That's not to say that medicine isn't still going to have a lot of its advantages, but it's just going to be different. So you really have to go onto the field because you love it, because there's something intrinsic about medicine that attracts you, because you don't want to be disappointed and come out and say, hey, I was going for a cardiac surgery and that no longer exists. So I was going to be an ER doc and I found out these jobs no longer exist. You'll have to be happy with the field, even if it's fundamentally different in terms of supply and demand and market economics than what you thought it would be at the beginning of your journey. And, you know, one thing Dave's pointed out to me in many of our yeah. private conversations about this is that um, other countries don't pay doctors what this country pays. No, uh, the the amount of money specialists make here, and he Dave envisions moving more to a European or Canadian type model where doctor compensation is 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 reduced, and and I think that's advice that you you're always giving when you're doing consultations with younger doctors about watching, being very careful about, you know, one way you I know you advise about it is hey you might want to not live in a in a place where the cost of living is so high if you want. You know, but just be aware of what's happening in the and as we move to more, you know, whether it's HMO or plans like that, it's just market forces at work are just not gonna allow yeah. over time the same compensation structure. I know you you feel very strongly about that. Absolutely. I mean, we can just see the profound way that COVID has accelerated the move towards telemedicine, the profound way in which it has radically changed the supply and demand of so many different fields. Uh, many in uh, medicine were stunned at the rapidity to which certain jobs disappeared or were radically altered in a matter of months because of this pandemic. Will things get back to normal? Probably not. Some things will come back, but others will be permanently altered. It's exciting. Uh, I think that's one of the things that makes life great because you never know what's around the corner, but you can't go into a field thinking this is the way it's going to be and then 12 years later, not be surprised that it's totally different than what you thought it would be. You have to always be uh, adaptable to change. Let's put a bow on it with that, Dave. I think that's a good way to close. But great article about the surge in med school apps. Absolutely. Now it's time for our step-by-step walkthrough of the college admissions process. Hey, Anika, how you doing? Uh, my stomach hurts a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> That's not TMI, TMI for our listeners. Mm-mm, just hurt. <laughs> put, your stomach, put your stomach business out there. It just You're going to make it through this podcast? <laughs> <laughs> I will. Yes, I will. Thanks. Okay. Okay, good. Well, we are in 142, chapter 142 of what book I wrote called 171 Answers to the Most Asked College Admissions Questions. And we're looking at priority dates, priority dates, mostly for admissions, but priority dates for a lot of things. Anika, you've read the chapter. What were your takeaways mm-hmm. and why, why priority dates are important is really what the chapter looks at. Yeah, well, I want to call them priority deadlines because deadline is all, you know, creates that sense priority of urgency. deadlines. <laughs> That's what I meant to say, not dates. Thanks for that correction. Priority deadlines. Yes. Deadlines. So these yes. are these deadlines that are set by these institutions, these colleges and these universities. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're much earlier than their regular admissions deadlines, which is, you know, start with admissions. Mm-hmm. And you say that students who meet these priority deadlines, you would, uh, what you say in the book is that they're treated differently. But I guess we could say that they receive some special treatment. Correct. Um, so we've got it broken down in two categories. So, you, okay, so priority deadlines around admissions and you got priority deadlines around financial aid. So how do you want to dive into these? 
Yeah. So, and I'll just throw a couple other ones out there just to touch on them, and then we'll focus on admissions and financial aid. There's also priority deadlines around housing, first choice of dorms. Mm, okay. You know, yeah, you're right. people that get their deposits in early get their first choice of dorms. Mm-hmm. And something you see not as common, that's very common. Uh, priority deadlines around course selection, also something else you'll see. But mm-hmm. let's keep our our prior, keep our attention focused on admissions and financial aid. So, okay. first of all, you know, let's talk about the you know what these are. So typically we're talking um, about deadlines into the early fall, you know, mm-hmm. as early as fam use is 930 this year, Anika. Oh, wow. It's passed. That's Good a priority. Now, that's a priority scholarship deadline hmm. for that Florida A&M. Uh, but 1015 is a very common date. 11-1, 11-15. So these, these are the t- times we're talking about. And... Let's focus on admissions, first of all. So why would a school have a priority deadline for admissions? What's what's in it for them? What would be the reason to do this? Well, for them, it's easier on their lives because they have, I guess, a better sense on who is seriously considering coming. Like they're not, you know, totally committed, but they want to know the seriousness of um, some people. And But you do talk about this. So let me stop you right there. Mm-hmm. So how how is it easier on their lives to know you know, who's applying to get an early read on who's applying? Well, I mean, it's, you know, it's just what, like we've talked about before, like they're building their classes. They're trying to build the class itself. Um, so they have to plan. They got to, you know, make their projections. Um, so, I mean, just that. Anything else beyond yeah, that? Let me, and, no, let me do a deeper dive on that because I think that's important. I want our listeners to know this. So let's say you are an admission office and let's say you know that your yield from Arizona is one out of every four. Remember, for everybody, yield is the percentage of accepted students that accept your offer. So if you have a one in four yield, that means every four kids you accept, one comes. You know that. You have data on that. Okay? And let's say you kind of want to get about 100 kids from Arizona. Like, that would be what you feel is a pretty balanced class for your school. That that would either be a big school if it's 100 in a class or it would be a place that would be close to Arizona. But let's just, just to keep the math simple, you know, 400, 100. So let's say you kind of know that, yeah, you'd like to kind of bring about 100 kids in from Arizona. That's what you normally do. So what happens, schools have trackers all along the way. They can tell. They can run projections and know if we're typically going to bring in a bring in 100, that means we need to accept 400. And we're used to having X number of applicants by the end of September, the end of October. They have all that data. So if they get an early read, which which an er, which a priority deadline does, it can let them know, oh, gee, you know, let's say it says, let's say you're used to getting, by September, you're used to having, you know, 100 applications in. You know you're going to get one out of four. But let's say this year, you know, you're only at 70. So what? how might that impact you in admissions? What do you think, Anika? Mm, I mean, well, you might not get the folks... <laughs> that you think you're going to get for one. So that's true. But what you also might do is you might, you know, you might accept a few more students from Arizona if these numbers continue to trend that way. Mm -hmm. Because because you might have to, you know, accept more to get the number that you want to get. And so that's an example of how, like, you you know, what you talked about, which is how the early planning, getting the early read can help you with your projections. Any other any other benefits that you can think of besides getting the early read? Uh, do, 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 do. well, for those schools that read applications, like you know, do the mm-hmm. holistic, I guess, reviews, they have time mm-hmm. to read. <laughs> now, <laughs> like, now you know, that's they get huge. to spread out more, right? So, that's a huge one. I'm going to talk about this a little bit more because this kind of dovetails into even our, you know, even our next discussion a little bit. But it's overwhelming for colleges to have to read so many applications um, late in the game. If they can mm-hmm. spread them out, it you know, it makes it so much easier for them. Now, this is something that Rick Clark from uh, who's been on our podcast twice, director of Mission Georgia Tech, he often gives this stat. He'll say, "Well, we have a deadline, and for them, October fifteenth has been a deadline for a long time for early action." He said, forty percent of people are going to apply in the last twenty four hours." Mm. You know, wow, and sixty percent apply within the last three days. You know. And it would help us so much if people could get it in earlier because we could start assigning applications to 
committees and having readers start reading rather than have a glut of work. You know, it would be, it'd be the equivalent of saying, it'd be so nice if my teachers at school would give me my syllabus in advance and I know my deadlines for my tests and my papers versus Friday tell me, you know, you got a paper due Monday morning and you got this, you know I mean? That's just the effect it has on the admissions office. And so it's very hard as I talk to admissions officers, they, when, when they're talking about their deadlines, and sometimes I'll say stuff to them like, you know, it'd just kind of be nice if you didn't have a deadline at 10.15, if you could move it to 11, one, And they'll say, they'll say, I just don't know how we could get everything read if we didn't have that deadline early, you know, mm-hmm. given the workload. So, Anika, a lot of people may remember our regular listeners. We had Greg Roberts on the podcast oh, a little more than a year ago, the director of admission, dean of admission at the University of Virginia. And they made a decision last year to go with not only add early decision and be the first flagship school to do it, but to do it with October 15th as a deadline. And I was talking with Greg. I saw, I met him at Boston, in Boston. And I was like, you know, Greg, I know you're getting a lot of blowback. This was in the Washington Post. There was all this blowback. UVA is selling out, you know, public mission and going with early decision. And there's a lot of blowback. And he was just had all kind of arrows flying at his back. Mm. And I, and I said, you know, I don't have a problem with the early decision. I get what that does for you managing your caseload. But do you have to do it October 15th? That just puts so much pressure on everybody to have everything in so early. And he was like, Mark, I don't know how we possibly could read everything if we don't mm-hmm. give ourselves that time. So that's the point you're making. Yeah. Okay. Second one. Okay. Any, any, any other advantages? Well, let's talk about the advantage to the students sometimes. Um, where you talk about where they, you know, the incentives around it. And one example you gave was how they waive the application fee. If you so can I can I mention one more advantage in, in for admissions first? They're going to kind of stay in that lane before mm-hmm. we shift gears. Sure. So, so the other big advantage to admissions is this is a, both a recruitment and a yield technique. So if you can get people to apply early, you're somewhat co- getting them to commit to make an emotional investment, you know, to invest in you, and they, mm-hmm. their emotions go with that, mm-hmm. and that helps you. Not only, of course, to get more applications, but also, you know, potentially can help you with your yield. And especially when it's tied to incentives. You know, the one thing that we haven't talked about a lot with this, with these priority deadlines is they often come with incentives, Mm -hmm. right? They often come with incentives like you'll be eligible for certain scholarships or they're oftentimes tied to early action or early decision deadlines. And people kind of know that there's higher acceptance rates. So they're also dangling incentives out there too. Okay, all right. We can shift gears on the highway, or you well, can no, come no, no. anything. Because I'm, at, I'm, okay. I'm glad you went back into the lane because I do have a okay. question around that. So sure. do you, so do you think that most kids? Because I know for Janaea, she did the early priority deadline, whatever, and it was her first choice. Yeah. So do you think that most people do that? That most people, you know, just it's not like okay, you're at number ten on yeah. my list, but I'm still going to meet your priority deadline. Yeah, so this is tricky, the question, because if, if it's early decision, of course it is because it's binding commitment. Mm-hmm. If it's early action, colleges hope that it will be. They hope that it'll be your first choice. Not necessarily, it doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily your first choice. It just depends on how many other early action schools a student applies to. Mm-hmm. So, but colleges are hoping that it's your first choice. Um, I had a very, very interesting conversation with a school who, made that clear to me in no uncertain terms that we regard um, early action as um, your commitment, you, you showing us that we are priority, that we're a priority to you, mm-hmm. you know, now, once again, you know, with early action, you do, unless it's restrictive early action, you do have other choices, but that's, that's what schools are hoping that people will do. Keep in mind, there's still only about 30% of people apply to seven schools or more. So a lot of people, you know, people may not know this, but the the most common number of schools people apply to, not the majority, but the most common number is still one. Hmm. In other words, if you were to put all the number of schools on a chart, right, the percentage that apply to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, the one that still has the most is number is one. So they're hoping that. And you're, they're certainly hoping that. I don't know if I answered your question or not. Amy. I think so. I mean, because when you okay. talk about the emotional connection, I mean, that Janae did have an emotional connection. <laughs> yeah. So I can't imagine her applying to a bunch of schools randomly priority deadline. Like, yeah. I just didn't know if that was a thing or not. 
Well, remember, a lot of times priority deadlines are, are linked to early action or early decision. In both cases, you're going to get an early notification. And so that also creates that emotional connection. If you get that early acceptance, that's really where you allow, you, you know, you've been guarding your heart. Now you allow your heart to just fall in love. And that's what they're relying on. That's what they're counting on. Mm-hmm. If that makes any sense. In fact, just to, just to kind of prove this point, I'll, I'll, you know, use kind of a, both a boarding school and a college example, but you know, I did boarding school admissions. You may remember in the, March 10th was when admissions decisions went out and April 10th was when you had to make a commitment by for boarding school. Mm-hmm. And so every now and then there'd be a school that would like let decisions out on April 9th, I mean, March 9th instead of March 10th. And people would freak out <laughs> because no, they would be because they would feel like you're getting an advantage. You're going to get the word out to somebody that they're accepted and now their heart's going to go out to you and it's going to make it harder for me to get the kid. It was like an agreed upon level the playing field, March 10th, April 10th. And that's why the, Ivy, and that's a, that's a boarding school example. College, there's what's known as Ivy Day. All the Ivy League agrees to announce their decisions on the same day. And the reason for that is we're not going to let anybody get ahead and get that emotional advantage of getting an acceptance out, having somebody's heart get into it. And then it's, we're, the rest of us are at a disadvantage. It's the same concept. Hmm, I'm smart. So anyway, those are some of the reasons. Now, what's the what's the takeaway for our listeners? Um, I think the one, and I'm not even sure if we mentioned it, but the uh, the organizational piece around all this in terms of getting yourself ready. <laughs> for well, that's these really important, right? Having a master calendar mm-hmm. and schedule. However, you whether you're an online calendar or you're you know you're a planner, I mean, you got to have a system because you can miss this stuff. Mm-hmm. And missing this stuff can cost you tens of thousands of dollars because this stuff can be linked to, to, I mean, so much, so many of these early priority deadlines are linked to scholarships. Right. You know, we probably haven't emphasized that a lot. We've talked a lot about admissions, mm-hmm. but so many of them are linked to you're eligible for X scholarship if you apply by this date. Yeah. So having a planner for sure is a huge takeaway. And you, you actually answered my question with FAM because, did you say it was FAM that moved theirs to September 30th? September 30th. Yes. What was the question? Yeah, well, I, well, I, I was going to ask it, you but, if people were it. if people were I like the Mike Pence and cut you off. <laughs> Mike, Mike, let me. I'm speaking, Mike. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> Somebody watched the debate. <laughs> so I'm just wondering if a lot of schools are moving theirs up so much earlier for whatever you know because of COVID. Obviously, you know how much that has impacted people moving their deadlines way earlier than what they normally are. I wonder how much that's going to increase. And so this is such an in- interesting conversation. I don't remember when we've ever done this, Anika, but our our part two is completely jives with our part one. Part two, meaning, you know, mm-hmm. where our bonus content is it, all about this. You know what we're going to transition to in a sec. Second. Oh, and yeah, yeah, yeah. And actually, I know I don't want to get too complicated with this, but um, I was going to say, can I just answer that when we get to the next segment? <laughs> I'm going to answer it. <laughs> yes, you can, as a matter of fact. Everybody, you got to okay. win. <laughs> okay. I've never done that before, but I know it's coming right up right away. <sighs> Anika and I are so grateful for everyone who has financially supported our podcast. It allows us to pay our staff and cover our other auxiliary expenses involved in having a weekly professional podcast. At the start of every month, we're going to start sending a special gift to anyone who financially supports your college-bound kid. I will be sending our donors this bonus content once a month directly to your email. The bonus content will be between 10 to 15 minutes in length. Usually it will be a college-related topic that I'm passionate about. Occasionally, it'll be another bonus hot topic in the news segment. Sometimes it'll be an answer to a question that one of our listeners submits to us via email. And you'll receive these monthly audio blogs for a gift of any amount. We know that $5,000 to one person is $5 to someone else. And we don't want your budget to be a hindrance to you receiving this additional bonus content. So if you want to support our show, just go to yourcollegeboundkid.com and click the donate button. And if you've already financially supported our podcast, you will automatically start receiving this bonus content via your email. This bonus content is our way of letting our financial supporters know in a tangible way how much we appreciate you. And if you have any questions at all about our monthly bonus content, just send your questions our way. That's to questions at your collegeboundkid.com. Once again, questions at your collegeboundkid.com. All right. So we are 
doing bonus content again, Mark, because your heart is screaming at you to tell you that you got all this good stuff to share. So we're going to, um, what are we going to skip a, a questions from the listeners for just a couple weeks? Yeah, I'm just going to ask our, our questions from the listeners just to be patient because it's just a lot of, it's not, it's not so much just that I've got this stuff on my heart and I got to get off my chest. It's that the things that I want to share, they impact seniors. And if I end up waiting every five weeks, which is what I normally do for bonus content, I'll be sharing stuff in June and people will be like, but the deadline was November. Why are you telling me that seven months late? <laughs> so I'm trying to get to people before January deadlines at least. No. And in some cases before, you know, November deadlines. Mm, that's all good. And so we're talking about why these early decision numbers are dropping and why these admissions people are not having a happy time right now. Exactly. And this is particularly for early decisions. So I want to look at why admission officers are freaking out about how low their early decision numbers um, are expected to be and what they're going to do about it. And this is just based on lots of conversations that I'm having uh, with admission directors, deans, VPs of enrollment, either one-on-one, -on -one, um, or this week I participated with eight different deans and directors in a counselor meeting. It wasn't a one-on-one, -on -one, but they were really, really transparent about this and the problem it's creating. And so kind of want to explain what's going on behind the scenes. I think it'll, you know, I think our listeners will like this. I've learned that when we kind of get into how the sausage is made, um, uh, we get good feedback. We get good email response that, you know, we're kind of scratching where people are itching. So that's what I want to talk about today. Let's go. Well, before we presume every anything, one thing I've learned is that people constantly confuse early decision and early action. Constantly. So I don't want to assume anything. So I want to start out with definitions. So for early decision, you have an early application deadline, usually November 1st or November 15th. Occasionally, October 15th. This is early decision one. A lot of schools have a second round of early decision and where you'll find, you know, deadlines usually going from January 1st to February 1st. But let's just focus on early decision round one. Okay. And you're notified early. So you have an early application deadline and then you're notified early, 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 early deadline, early notification. Notification is usually before Christmas for early decision, you know. If you're admitted, you can be admitted, denied, or deferred. Deferred meaning pushed to the regular round. But if you're admitted, it's binding, meaning you got to go. And they try to put some teeth into it. It's not legally binding, but it's morally binding. They make parents sign that you'll go. They make students sign and they make counselors sign. And they say you should withdraw all your applications if you're admitted. So that's early decision. It's often confused with its cousin, early action which also has an early deadline, also has an early notification date, usually before January 15th, but you're a free agent until May 1st. So you can research and shop around. So that's the difference between the two. So I just want everybody to be clear on, on um, that. Is everything clear in definitions? Mm -hmm. All clear. So a lot of people think, well, I like EA better, you know? You know, it allows me to preserve my freedom. But here's the thing, not you don't get to pick how schools decide to let you apply. Some schools offer ED only. Some schools offer EA only. Some schools offer ED and EA. Most schools actually don't offer either. This is really something that's more common with selective schools, although it's growing. You know, it's about 300 colleges in the country that offer EA um, and a little less than that that offer ED. And remember, that's about one eighth of the four year um, accredited school. So this is not something you'll see um, that common. Uh, but it's very, very, very common with with selective schools and with private schools and increasingly with public schools as well. That's a little bit of background. So there are benefits to the school and there are benefits to the student for to apply early decision. What do you think the benefits to the school would be and the benefits to the student, Anika? Well, benefit to the school, they got you. You're in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I love how you just get to the point. They, they snatched you. They snatched, they snatched you, you. It's a wrap. <laughs> um, so, I, again, it helps with their planning, filling their class. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to get into the financial thing because I feel like there's something there, but maybe not. Mm -hmm. um, the benefit to the student, obviously, they're done. Like, I don't have to keep going through this strenuous process for the next few months. I'm good. I'm in my favorite place, hopefully your favorite place. Mm -hmm. um, and you're all locked in. Uh, I know there's something else there. I just can't think of it. Yeah. So, so you mentioned a good benefit to the student. 
you know, peace of mind. Enjoy the senior year. You know where you're going before Christmas. You can start to plan. I'm going to be living in, you know, California or I'm going to be living in Illinois or whatever. Um, other benefit to the student is that it's um, a lot easier to get an early decision than it is to get oh, a regular. Oh, how could I forget that one, Lord Jesus? Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, but what I really want to go into is why it's so helpful to the school. And then what I want to talk about is all these eight admission officers I met with this one meeting and then individual meetings I've had um, so far this year have indicated that everybody is afraid. They are afraid. They're afraid of how low, how few applications they're getting early decision and what impact that's having on them and on you. So that's kind of where I'm going. But before I do that, I think it's important to understand for people to understand why it carries so much weight in the admission process, why it matters so much. It matters so much that many schools have a second round of early decision. There's a lot of logistics when you have a second round. You know, there's a lot of pressures, deadlines that you have to do within your office. You're not going to do something like that unless there's value to you. So let's talk about why it, you know, why it matters so much. Now you said helps them in the planning, which is basically just getting to the gist of it. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to just, just want to do a little deeper dive on, on unpack that a little bit more. So the first thing is in admissions, you have the Herculean job of having to please so many constituencies and it's not easy. So for example, if you don't bring in a certain number of alumni, alumni are going to be pissed off at you. Okay. You can't, you can't just keep denying all these alumni kids. You know, you know that you're in that office. <laughs> <laughs> you're the one to probably get the phone calls. All the alumni can't get in. And and they're going A&T a anymore. You here and there. <laughs> yeah. So you so you got to please the alumni. You got the development or advancement office. They're trying to build new buildings and do new projects and get financial aid and faculty compensation up. So they're trying to raise money. So they want you to bring some people who can write a big check. Athletics. That's huge. That's not just down to the athletes in general or even to the team. It's down to the individual position. Baseball coach needs a shortstop. Okay. The volleyball coach needs a striker. I mean, it's down to the individual positions. Orchestra, they want to be good. And and the arts, then you're trying to get almost 50 states, as many countries as possible. Uh, for students of color, it's not just enough to have students of color. For a PWI, you need to have people are looking at your Asian American numbers and your Black numbers and your Latinx numbers. Okay, now the majors, I mean, you you have to make sure that the faculty have enough students to come in per major. Otherwise, people are going to get laid off. They're going to be, why should we keep paying this professor to teach French if we don't have anybody interested in French? So you got to keep, you know, bringing a number of different people interested in a number of different things. Mm. And then there are people that are studying your numbers. And they feel like if you're really a good school, your acceptance rate should be getting lower and your test score should be higher, your GPA should be higher. So you got to do that with a, what looks like a better academic class than the year before. So that's so much pressure to bring in a balanced class like that, that the only way to really, well, I won't say the only way, the best way to secure your chances of doing that is to lock certain people up early so that at least it ensures that you got different people from different constituencies and you have a much better chance of getting an early class. Does that make sense, Aniga? Yes, it does. That's one component. Second component, if you know that you basically, because it's binding, you basically get almost one for one in early decision, meaning if I accept 100 kids, I get 100. Now, it's not quite that simple because studies show you end up actually getting between 87 and 97 out of 100 because technically people can wiggle out if they say the money's not good enough and you can't throw them in jail. But because they make all those signatures and everybody sign and it's seen as kind of a moral violation if you're not keeping your word around nine and 10, depending on the school, some schools, 97, 98 out of a hundred, they end up getting. Okay. So let's just basically call it one for one. You accept one, you get one in early decision. Okay. There's a lot of schools in regular decision. They have to accept six to get one Anika, or five to get one. That's very common or four to get one. So that makes your job so much harder that you have to bring in that many, you have to do that many more acceptances to get one. And the third thing is, remember I said all these schools are trying to become a lot more selective. So the more slots you fill up early, 
That means the less slots are there for regular where you get most of your applications, which is how the acceptance rates get down. And that's the gamesmanship in admissions. You know, people are trying to build their brand of scarcity as part of their marketing by saying, wow, you know, we accepted 38% last year. and This year we're down at 29%. We're hot. When people think you're the hot school and they sense that momentum, they're willing to do two things. One, your yield rate will go up because they'll feel your that your degree has more mar- value in the marketplace. They'll feel like, oh, what an honor. I was one of the ones selected. And also you can charge more tuition and people will pay because they'll value the brand more. So hopefully people get, you know, the value to all of those things. Do anything clear or anything confusing about that? Mm-mm, it's all still clear. All right. So that's all background. That was all my background. I know I'm, I know I'm like being long winded. I know, I know, I know, I know. Long background. Yeah, it's coming. We so, know. so here's the deal though. Because it's binding and because schools have not had visitors for so long, going back from March to most schools still not doing visits now, then so many people are saying, I'm not making a binding early decision to a school I haven't visited. So when I was on, you know, this week with these eight, and these were eight highly selective schools, every one of them said they're behind right now in their early decision numbers, you know, based on where they, you know, where they were in mid-October last year. And they, they said it'd be a miracle for us to get the same numbers that we had. So first thing is everybody's admitting they're down. They're not going to see their same numbers. That's, that's the first thing. And it's understandable, right? If you can't visit a school, then I'm just not comfortable committing. But they're also saying we are feeling pressure. And they admitted it. We are feeling pressure to bring in a certain number of kids early. So admission officers report to different people. It's very common for them to report to the academic side, deans and provosts also can report to the president. And then you got the board of trustees very closely watching that stuff because, hey, tuition is still the number one thing that drives the budget. So you got a lot of people watching. You got the board looking at the numbers, the president, deans, provosts. So they're feeling pressure. And so what they shared with me in this session I had this week, and I've heard it in individual sessions as well, is we might just lower the bar this year a little bit and take kids that we wouldn't have taken before because it's just way too risky for us to think we can get a balanced class in the regular round where we'll have to take five to get one or four to get one rather than one to get one. And we might end, and we might end up with several constituencies ticked off at us because we just didn't get enough people in your bucket. Mm-hmm. So what part of the bar are they lowering? Oh, I mean, it means that the, it means that they, let's okay. Let's say it's a school that's very selective that typically takes a kid that's like three eight, you know, let's say high thirteen hundreds SATs, thirty thirty one ACT. Uh, but they're seeing their ED round cut in half or two thirds of what it is. You know, they might take a kid that's three six. You know, mm-hmm. and uh, and test optional. Of course, this year we don't need your test scores. So that's what I want people to know. But what I don't want people to do is now freak out and panic and think they have to apply early decision. Because one of the downsides we never talked about, we talked about the upside, Anika. One of the downsides is you lose your ability to compare financial aid offers. Right. Yeah. Most importantly. Yeah. Now, in some cases, your best financial aid offer will come ED because the schools with the most money are usually the ones that offer ED. So it's tricky. You can get your best aid offer ED because... Wealthy schools with great packages um, are the ones that offer this. And if you pass on this and you go regular, then you don't get in. And then you end up getting in another school that doesn't have the pockets that are as deep. So it's complicated. You can actually get your best financial aid offer ED, but you also sometimes may not because you lose the ability to compare compare financial aid offers. So it's it's complicated. You can't just say you apply ED and you're going to get less money. That's not necessarily true. Hmm. If you, if you, I mean, I'll use an extreme Harvard. Okay. Well, I can't use Harvard because they have, they have what's called restrictive early action, which is slightly different than ED, but I'll use rice. Okay. Rice has early decision and rice has an incredible financial aid package for families that make like, uh, you know, mid one, mid one hundreds, hmm. you know, you pretty much, you can count on free tuition, free tuition 
if your income is, um, I don't remember, I think it's 130, 130,000 free tuition, mm. which is like, you know, $50,000 perk almost. Wow. So that's a school with deep pockets, highly selective. You could pass on that, try regular, then you don't get in most of the time. So it's, it's tricky for families and not telling everybody to go out and jump and jump off the bridge and go ED and you're under pressure. Go find an ED school by November one. And a lot of people feel that pressure. A lot of people will say to me, I don't know where I'm going to apply an ED, but I know I'm ED in somewhere. Oh. I'm, like, <laughs> and I'm like, oh man, oh man. Cause that's like telling me, oh, I don't know who I'm goodness. getting married, but I'm getting married before 25. I'm finding somebody. Oh, goodness you know? gracious. Wow. I guess. Wow. That's rough. <laughs> All right. There you go. I, I, so I've been just rambling and talking here. Any any thoughts? Because I'm about to wind down. I think I've, I've shared what I wanted to share today. Well, on this well a couple of things. I just, I just can't imagine applying to a school ED, not visiting like that's I just that's unfathomable to me. Um, the second thing is that, you know, how do we because isn't there some way that you can get a sense of your financial aid, even if you do consider the ED, because you can go and do the net price calculator and all that stuff. Right? Correct. Correct. You can do the net price calculator. And if the net price calculator, and if the numbers don't match up and you get your offer, you cannot go. Mm-hmm. And what I encourage people to do, even that schools don't like this, they want you to withdraw your offer if you're admitted. If you are not a full pay family and money's important to you, then I tell my families, don't withdraw your offer until you see their offer and make sure it lined up with the net price calculator. Mm-hmm. Now, believe it or not, I actually don't have that exact view that you have of not applying ED without visiting. That's the ideal. But in a pandemic, we don't have a choice of visiting. And I know for certain people that you may not get in if you don't apply somewhere. There's times it's worth it. It's worth taking that chance. And there's mm-hmm. ways you can learn enough about the school that you can know it's a place that offers, like they offer enough for you to make it a good experience. Mm-hmm. And the downside of mo- losing out on that offer is worth it. If you look at the whole QuestBridge, which we won't get into now, I'm going to talk about later. QuestBridge has a whole early decision thing, and most of those people don't get to visit. And that program accepts, you know, f- matches a thousand kids a year oh, through early decision. Goodness. And mm-hmm. students have love it. Parents love it. Look, it is not ideal. It is absolutely not ideal. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to say that. Mm-hmm. But I'm going to say sometimes, you you know, your choices aren't always great choices. You know? like. It's kind of like you had to fly somewhere and you like, I remember I missed a flight to Boston uh, a summer ago because I, I got all the way to the gate, Anika, and I didn't have my bag. And I knew that I'd taken my, my bag with me. Mm. I actually let, I went through like your main bag, you know, it was one of these things, the airport was having some issues. So I said, you need to check, you need to take your main bag and check on and take it with you and go through the conveyor belt. I went through that thing and <laughs> left my big bag there. So I got to the game. I'm like, where's my bag? Oh my God. Oh my goodness. So like land airport. So busy. Then I don't remember what gate I'm at. Security gate. <laughs> it was terrible. <laughs> I'm going all over the airport in Atlanta. Got this brand new luggage explaining it. They're mm-hmm. saying, you don't remember what gate you went through. I was like, no, I don't remember. Oh. <laughs> Take, it took me three hours. Mm-hmm. You know, they finally found my luggage. So now, guess what? I did not have good choices. I was supposed to be at Harvard for six days for, you know, for some professional development and training. And ceremonies and everything started that evening, Sunday night. And I'm stuck in Atlanta airport. So I didn't have good choices. You know, it was pay this flight astronomical or go on this airline and play this flight astronomical. Mm. I didn't have good choices. So sometimes, so that's kind of how I see it right now. Like, You may not be able to visit. That's not a great option, but it's also not a great option to turn down a particular school that could be an amazing experience that you might not get a chance to get in if you try your regular admission. Mm, Okay. Thoughts, Anika? (laughs) Well, good luck with that because I don't don't know. Yeah, okay. I trust you. You've done it for years and years and years. (laughs) I know you know what you're talking about, but I just, yeah. Oh, 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 hold on one second, Andy, because Dave called me. Okay. Hey, Dave. Hey, Mark. I'm in the session. All right. I'm just just closing up with Anika right now. Okay, just. No problem. And by the way, I think I know what the problem was yesterday. Because I came <laughs> on here with Anika. Yeah. I came on here with Anika, and I had the same problem with her. And I'm like, I told Dave it was his problem. 
you know, because she couldn't hear me. Yeah. My mic wasn't on. <laughs> <laughs> see, see how he knows me? That figures. I know you. All right. I'll see you in a few. All right. Thanks, my friend. I Are might you? leave that. I might leave that on the final version so people can see how much of a nut I am. Not edit it out. You want to go ahead and wrap it up? Yeah, let's wrap it up now because I'm, I'm spiraling down. The more we go, <laughs> I think I might just have an ex- laugh at my expense and leave that on the final version. Oh my goodness! All right, friends. When Anika and I were talking about priority deadlines, and she asked me about deadlines, and I said. Hold on. Can we hold on to that? I'll bring it up in the next section because that dovetails perfectly into our next conversation. And then I forgot to bring it up. And what I wanted to say is so many schools are extending their deadlines for early decision. Not Watch and notice how many schools have moved from November 1st to November 15th or for early decision two from January 1st to January 15th or even February 1st. All of that is because they're not getting enough applications and they're worried. So they're shifting their deadlines. So that's a telltale when you see a school move their deadlines. They're not happy with their applicant flow, their applicant pool. It's something absolutely worth paying attention to. And one last thing I want to comment on. I just want to underscore, it should be in the rarest of circumstances that you make an early decision uh, commitment to a school you can't visit. Um, I understand in this pandemic world, you just may not be able to do it. Um, I had somebody I worked with last year uh, during the pandemic. They still took a trip to Boston. And even if they couldn't get in and have an official tour, they spent enough time on and around the campus to know that that was not the school for them. So if at all possible, even if the school is not doing official tours, if your finances allow for it, I'd recommend that it's, it is good to touch it, taste it, feel it, see it, experience the life around the the college town and interface with students in any way you can. And I just kind of want to make that clear because I don't think I emphasized that enough in my conversation with Anika. All right. Ciao. Friends, you're in for a treat. A three-part interview with William Segur, Associate Dean of Admissions at Emory University, Emory College here in Atlanta. And as I mentioned before, we did have some technical issues, uh, but it's worth it because Basically, what William's going to do is let you know how the sausage is made, what goes on at committee. So in part one of this three-part interview on what is CBE, Will gives his background. He tells us what roles he's had in the admission office. He tells us what a pre-reader does to help admissions officers. Um, I talk about my experience sitting in an Emory admission reading file with the team, and Will talks about his experience with Jeffrey Salingo, because Emory is one of the three schools that Salingo sat in, watched and observed their admission process as part of the research he did for his excellent book. Listen and enjoy. And now, this week's interview with a special guest. I'm here with William Segura, the Associate Dean of Admissions at Emory University. Welcome to the York College Bound Kid Podcast, William. I'm excited to be here. Uh, I really am. I've been listening to the podcast, not all the time, but I've heard some of the episodes, and uh, I'm just excited to be a part of the conversation today. Well, as hard as they work you in college admissions, if you were listening all the time, you probably wouldn't be doing your job. So I'll cut you some slack on that. No problem. (laughs) Thank you. So, William, it's always interesting to our listeners to learn about our interviewee's backstory. Uh, why don't you take a little time? Tell us about your upbringing, how you got interested in admissions, any different admissions jobs you've had, and what you're doing now. Uh, sure. Uh, so, I can, I can ramble. So, as my wife says, feel free to cut me off if needed. But No, go for it. Go for it. Take your time. I'm originally from uh, Long Island, New York. And uh, we moved to Atlanta when I was a child. So um, 1992 is when we moved to New York. And my, uh, my parents moved to the U.S. from Columbia, uh, from South America. Um, so they, they wanted to move down to Georgia in 1992, just seeking kind of a new opportunities, um, some reduction from the cost of living expenses, quality of life, et cetera, the weather. <laughs> uh, uh, um, so in 1992, we packed up a, a U-Haul and, um, and moved to Atlanta. And we didn't, my parents, so scary as now I'm a father and a husband. Uh, 
they didn't, I don't know that they had a plan, but uh, they moved down here and got an apartment and they made it work. And it was super scary uh, for them, I imagine. And, um, you know, we grew up under-resourced in every single financial sense of the conversation. Uh, but we were very rich in what I would call love and nice. like, traditions. And so that was, we were really fortunate, really blessed there. Um, so I'm first gen college, first gen U.S. Uh, I'm bilingual, so I speak English and Spanish at home, and you know, teaching our son that now. So that's been amazing to watch. Um, and I worked my way through college, so I earned my BBA at Georgia State University, which is in Atlanta, it's a great institution. Um, and then I earned my MBA from from Memory, where I work at the university. Um, I'm, I'm a proud husband. Uh, father, um, and I've got one here at home who's, who's taking a nap as we speak, and then I've got one on the way who will be here in about a month. So by the time this airs, uh, he'll be born. <laughs> so, <laughs> Great. Uh, that was exciting. So, um, yeah, it's a little bit about me. I really love problem solving, helping others, and I really enjoy being active and being outside, running, biking. So that's a little bit about, about my backstory. And the question was talking about the kind of admissions piece and the different roles that I've had in admissions. And so in terms of my interest in admissions, um, I, I've worked in the Office of Undergraduate Admission at Emory University since 2011. Um, August 15th was actually my first day, so I'm celebrating my anniversary just a couple of days later. Congratulations. Thank you. So this is year number nine in admissions, uh, which is crazy. Uh, but before that, I, I worked in project management, and I learned a whole lot. That was right after college. And ultimately, I really decided that I wanted to being in an arena in an environment where I could impact the lives of young adults and really uh, give them some positive influence the way that my life had been impacted. So that was important. And uh, an opportunity at Emory opened sub up and, and the rest is really history. Thank you. Uh, so that's how I kind of got into the role of admissions because I, I mean, you've done these before these interviews, obviously, Mark, I don't, I think anyone ever says when I grew up, I want to be an admission counselor, an admission officer. We've talked about that with the almost every other interview. We you know that interviewee that comes up, that comes up, that conversation. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that wasn't in my third grade. Uh, you know, what's going to happen, you know, when I'm an adult um, timeline. But, you know, once I landed in admissions and I started working at Emory, um, my first uh, role in the office, one of my many roles, my, my first role was really focused on uh, being part of our diversity initiatives team. And I was really working with our Latinx community, um, undocumented community, things of that nature. And so I started a couple of programs, one of them called CORE, which was, uh, stands for Cultural Overnight Recruitment Experience. And uh, really proud of the work we did there. We were helping underrepresented kids, low-income kids, first-generation kids, high-achieving kids uh, from all kinds of backgrounds across the country, um, across the U.S., come to Emory and really experience that as a prospective student. And then on the undocumented front, I'm really just proud of some of the work we've done and partnering with, uh, you know, places like Freedom University and just other places, uh, Golden Door Scholars outside, outside the Carolinas, just working with them to bring um, really great talents uh, to Emory as well. So, I mean, I've done those things on the diversity initiative side, also worked, uh, you know, traveled, recruited, reviewed applications, things like that. Um, and then I've maintained some projects over the years. So now I, I, my focus is on our Atlanta community engagement. You know, as we know, you and I know, and for our listeners, um, Emory is located in Atlanta, right? And so I focus on making sure that our backyard is taken care of, that we're uh, serving the Atlanta community. And I mean, Mark, you've seen this. I came by and visited Kit, but it's not just about visiting, right? It's about how we're working with our communities and making sure that um, we're providing access to opportunities in education. So. It's a big part of the work that I'm doing now. Um, I also serve as our liaison to our athletics department. So anytime that anyone wants to play a sport in Emory, I work directly with our coaches on that front to make sure that they have all the tools they need and they understand what um, a competitive candidate looks like in Emory and what the, what the tools are they need to be successful for, from a student standpoint. I'll tell you what, there, there's a lot there I could comment on. First of all, I totally relate to your story, story of how you got to Atlanta. Because uh, I was just 17 years after you. It was 2009. But I heard you say cost of living. I heard you say warm weather. I heard you say better opportunities. And I also heard you say that there wasn't necessarily a plan in mind. Like, I actually picked up and left uh, an admissions job I was in in Pennsylvania. It said I'm mo selling a home, moving to Atlanta before I even had a job here. So I, I definitely related to that, um, related to a lot, a lot of different things that, you know, that you shared. And I can attest that you are a dedicated father and 
and husband, because you you know this. Well, we've been talking about this interview for about a year, and we had to try to time it around the the new baby and the husband That's and right. the and the father That's responsibilities, right. and finally got a window here. So I can definitely attest to to you being dedicated there. Let's take a break to learn about Mark's recommended resource for the week. Friends, last week for our recommended resource, we gave you a step-by-step walkthrough for the FAFSA. However, if you're applying to wealthy or private schools that have significant endowment resources, they're going to require an additional form. And that form is a bear. It is the CSS profile. It's a lot more in-depth. And you're going to love completing this like you love getting a root canal. I'm just going to be really honest. It's complex. And if you own a business, set aside five hours to do this puppy. So you're going to need a great resource. And we have a fantastic resource for you today. It is a step-by-step walkthrough of the CSS profile by a real pro. It's Gail Holt, who's the Dean of Admission at Amherst College, and she's a CSS profile expert, having held leadership positions related to the CSS profile for decades. And Gail is interviewed by MIFA. MIFA is a fantastic organization. It stands for the Massachusetts Educational Financing Authority, and they help students and parents and college counselors with a number of issues related to paying for college. So you can get the great step-by-step walkthrough by Gail Holt. You can access it at MIFA's website, which is just MIFA.org. You can also access it by going to YouTube and going to the MIFA YouTube channel, and you'll see the in-depth step-by-step walkthrough by Gail Holt. She just did it recently, September 23rd, 2020. We'll put the link in the show notes. But if you're applying for financial aid, one of these selective schools that requires the profile, this is the best step-by-step walkthrough CSS profile video that I've ever seen, ever. So that's how good I think it is, and I can't recommend it highly enough. We'll now return to my interview with William Segura. You know, I actually didn't know you played a role sort of in the athletic liaison role. That that would have been another interesting topic, uh, you know, we could have discussed is uh, how that whole process works at at, uh, you know, an academic D3, the whole athletic recruitment process. It sounds like I might be back for another episode. Yeah, absolutely. You beat me to it. <laughs> 2021. I'll put you, I'll put you right. on the calendar. <laughs> so I, you know, I, I love, I'm blessed to have those opportunities on the engagement side, on the athletic side. And um, I promise I'll stop talking after this in terms of this stuff. But No, keep it going, man. We love it. This is what it's all about. <laughs> conversation. The other things that I'm working on in the office, uh, I work on our selection team. and. And for those of you who are listening, you may not, you know, may not know that term, but we're really talking about the process of how we select applicants to Emory and how we read applications. And so I, uh, in addition to being part of that selection team, I also uh, hire and manage all of our pre-reading staff. And uh, some institutions do this, some institutions don't, but we have a set of very skilled, amazing pre-readers. Some may be listening now, and they help um kind of set up the application for us so that when we begin to read applications, we're fully prepared and, and have everything we need so we can hit the ground running, so to speak. And so... Hey, well, well, why don't you go into depth on that? I've talked about pre-readers before, but yeah, you know, add a little flesh to that. Let our listeners know uh, what exactly the pre-readers do, you know, to help, your, help the admissions officers be more efficient when you're actually reading a file. Yeah, I think the important thing to note here is that context matters. And so every school is different. And so Emory does it one way. That doesn't mean that school B or school C or whatever the other school is yeah. it doesn't the same way. Um, but for Emory, uh, we have a team of pre-readers who have been with us for a long time. So they're incredibly seasoned. <laughs> you know, I just got just finished some of our rehires and new hires. And so I feel like I'm you know, telling you about the job description. Uh, but what they do is uh, they will recalculate GPA for our, all of our applicants because we recalculate every applicant's GPA that applies to Emory uh, because we want to have them all on the same scale, so to speak, on a 4.0 scale. And so we train them extensively uh, to, pre- to uh, recalculate all of our GPAs. Um, they also do a little bit of data identification and data mining, so to speak, whether 
looking at certain areas in our letters of recommendations to identify certain characteristics we're looking for so that when we look at that information, it's ready for us to quickly understand uh, certain attributes that are important to us. And then, you know, for our reading CRM, there's a dashboard that pops up when we read. And so we instruct them on how to identify certain information in the transcripts, for example, curricula, uh, and list it out in the dashboard for us so that when we open it up, when we open up the transcript, it's quick and, under- and we can understand what we're looking at and, um, and where we need to focus our attention so that that process can be um, as holistic but as um, efficient as possible. Couple of good cool questions. So you want a little inside shop with the CRM. Most people will, will know that, but some may not. You want to explain what a CRM is? Yeah, I mean the technical term might be client relationship management. I think what what we CRM. I can Google that real quick. But essentially, uh, it's how we use. It's the software we use to review applications. And so in this case, we use something called Slate, which in uh, the admissions world is quite common. It's a company called Technolutions. And so that's what I mean when I say CRM is the platform we use uh, where we log in to read applications. Our regular listeners will know uh, back on 80, episode 85, I did a kind of deep dive into Slate. But, you know, we get not everybody hears every episode. So for those who want to know more about Slate, go back there. You can learn, do a 30 minute deep dive on how Slate works and functions. And I'll tell you, I've never met a single admission office yet that doesn't like Slate. Is that how you feel as well? Um, you know, we've been with Slate now. This is not the exact date, but it's been at least four or five years. This is not an advertisement for Slate, but yes, it, it's very smooth and, and works well. And so it give, gives us all the functionality that we need from what I understand. But, you know, then again, you know, this is a plug for our IT team. Our, our data and IT team do an incredible job of configuring um, Slate so that it works really well. We have a really robust team that, that manages that process. And honestly, if, we, if it wasn't for them, you know, I don't know what, what it would look like for us. So I, I give thanks to them. You know, and a lot of times when people think about Slate, they think about sort of sophisticated metrics for tracking demonstrated interest. I know you're using it in much, much different ways than just that. And, um, well, I don't know. We probably won't get off too much on a tangent on that. But uh, let me go back to to uh, the training you're doing for the pre-readers. So I'm assuming then a lot of that must be teaching them how to read a school profile, teaching them how to read secondary school reports and counselor letters, because that's where you'd get a lot of that context about the, the GPA in there. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. They do look extensively at the school profile. Uh, we train them very much so on understanding context of what school they're looking at. And let's be clear, they're not making any decisions on applicants. Right. They're not citing any student's fate. They're simply, the analogy I like to use is if we're going to sit down for dinner, Somebody, if we're going to make dinner, somebody needs to slice the onions, someone needs to dice the tomatoes, someone needs to get the celery out, someone needs to get the vegetables out, get the cutting board out. That way, when I walk in the kitchen, I can get to work. Um, and so that's what they're doing, um, is they're setting things up for us. But by all means, they need to know what celery looks like. They need to know what tomatoes look like. And they need to know how to, what kind of knife we're going to use, using that same example. Um, and so, yes, they're trained extensively on looking at school profiles, understanding what those are and what they're saying, but they're not making any kind of decisions, nor are they giving us a recap of letters of recommendations. Uh, they're just identifying certain things that we're looking for in those letters. Yeah, and and if you put it in an admission reader context, there are all kinds of different GPA scales out there, as you, you know all too well. So if a school's got a 7-0 GPA or a 9-0 GPA or 5-0 GPA, Low, or, you know, low is high or high is good. Like you, you got to blow through a lot of files in a relatively efficient amount of time. You could, it could take you a lot of time trying to figure out what this, this individual school's, you know, grading system is. And so they're saving you the time from having to do that when you get to a file. And by no, and by no means is anybody perfect. I mean, this is a human process. And so luckily, you know, when we open up the application after the preview just looked at it, I'm going to, I'm going to, the first thing I'm going to do is open up the dashboard and look at the transcripts. Um, I mean, Mark, you've been in the room when we've read applications. You've seen that process. I don't, I don't know how close you saw it, but you I mean you were in the room, so you, you kind of heard. No, they were, you know, Will and I mean, they're Tim Fields. They were very, very transparent. And any question I could answer, you know, I asked, they answered, and it was very kind of them. They even let me ask questions myself about certain things. It was fantastic. Well, you know, to that point, you know, this shouldn't be a mysterious black box. <laughs> 
Um, at least that is my opinion, right? Yeah. Um, these students are putting a lot of time into this work, and this is why we do this. I mean, this is why this is not a plug for this either. But this is why if you read Justin Lingo's new book, you'll see we're in there and in detail, right? And this is yeah. why great people like yourself, Mark, who come and see our process, right? I mean, we want to make sure people understand how we're doing it, what we're doing it, because it's not all the same. And that's not to speak poorly or positively for anybody. It's just to say it's different everywhere. Yeah, and this is actually a, a really good transition to our our topic, which is um, we're looking at how files are read in the admission office and look, particularly a couple of different methods. By the way, before we get into that, I, I will say we featured Salingo's book. I do a recommended resource of the week uh, every, every episode. And so... Um, are you, I'm, ass, I'm assuming you're talking about who gets in and why a year in the life of college admissions. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. We recommended that book highly probably about six weeks or so ago. Uh, so Emory was one of the three schools that he sat in on. I know he's focused on three schools. Emory was one of them. And I got an opportunity. I had an opportunity to, to take a look at it before um, it went out, so to speak. And uh, little to my surprise, <laughs> or to my surprise, I should say, the first, like the intro, mm-hmm. like the and the first paragraph was a conversation in our committee, in the Southeast Committee, which I chair. Um, and it was this conversation about how we were going through our committee process and all of these details. And I remember my heart kind of beating. I was like, wow, this is very deep. This is, he, he nailed it. He really did a great job of explaining it. So yes, we, we were on the book. And it, was, it was great to work with. Awesome, awesome. Next week in the news, an article by Jay Matthews of the Washington Post. Top colleges should grow rather than crow about rejecting nearly everyone. Mark and Anika will discuss what is the difference between need-blind and need-aware admissions. Our question from a listener are, what are the best ways to engage with the colleges you are interested in when you can't visit them? Our interview is part two with William Secura, the assistant dean at Emory, on understanding three models of decision-making for admission committees. And our college spotlight is James Madison in Harrisburg, Virginia. But now, college spotlights are back. And thanks to Keisha from Ohio, who sent in a request for Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana. Muncie's a town of 70,000 people. It's 63 miles northeast of Indianapolis. And for a long time, Dave, you and I had a string of nicknames and and mascots for colleges that were very unique. But this one is more popular. It's the Cardinals, the bird, just like Louisville. Yeah. A school with Tudor Gothic and modern style architecture. Plenty of trees and beautiful changes of colors. You get off the four seasons in Muncie. Fascinating history when you look at uh, Ball State. So originally, it was a small teacher training school that opened in 1899. And after the community's efforts to sustain the college failed, the Ball brothers purchased the land and buildings of the defunct school and donated it to the state of Indiana. Guess how many Ball brothers there were, Dave? Two. Five. Oh, wow. (laughs) Yeah. So I guess when five Ball brothers pull off the money and donate it to the state of Indiana. The gift actually became the Indiana State Normal School Eastern Division in 1918. What better name for it than Ball State? Name it after the Ball Brothers. Well, they could certainly have their own ball team with five hoop players. <laughs> yeah, they have a starting five. <laughs> Your mind's on the, on the Lakers closing up the heat. Oh, yes. Yes, and generosity for the generosity. The Indiana General Assembly changed the name originally to Ball Teachers College in 1922. And then from Ball's Teachers College in 1922, it became Ball State Teachers College in 1929. And then 31 years later, in 1960, the region's Teachers College had begun to attract faculty from outside the Midwest. And the student was looking for majors in things like business and architecture and other uh, disciplines, so it became Ball State University. And, you know, it's it's interesting to, to to share that history because history explains the present so well. 
And if you heard a lot, if there's one thing you heard in there, Dave, it was teaching, 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 right? Right. And what is one of the things Ball State is most known for? It's an incredible program in elementary education. So it never sort of strayed from its roots. Still one of the top places uh, students go in the Midwest that really want to pursue all education, to be honest. But ed- elementary education would be their, would be their specialty. Uh, some of the other things that Ball State is really known for, um, they have an exceptional radi- radio and TV, communication and journalism, architecture, disability services, and support services. Advertising is strong. Digital communication and media is strong. Public relations is strong. Speech communication and rhetoric is a strong program. And so is actuarial science and kinesiology and exercise science. And one other major that I haven't mentioned that's strong, which believe it or not, I'm still learning exactly what they do. Family systems. Any idea what family systems is as a major day? Uh, Some type of counseling? I mean, you know, there's family systems therapy. There's family systems theory. It's an approach to, to you know, to to counseling and to conflict resolution. And so, yeah. So, Dave, I didn't know what family systems was. Uh, learned, doing my research on Ball State led me to to research it. Family systems is known as a form of therapy, a form of psychotherapy that helps okay. people resolve issues in the context of a family unit. So it's a form of uh, family counseling. And I didn't even know there was a major in family systems, and that's one of the things Ball State's known for. They've also got a, a co-op program, which is nice. Uh, some strong business programs as well. And I'm going to go over the stats. Let you see the stats for the school. And I think that'll okay. kind of give you a sense of it. Uh, but before I do, I want to talk about something that Ball State's known for besides some of the things I've already shared. They're, they're a school that's a pretty decent size. Um, it's a public school, of course, in, in Indiana. But it feels like a smaller school. I mean, so we're talking about a school that has almost 17,000 undergraduates. Oh, wow, that's big. Yeah, almost 22,000 students when you consider grad students. So it's a pretty decent sized school, you know? This is not a small school. Yeah. But it's got that Midwest down home vibe about it. And it's something anybody that goes there talks about. It feels professors are approachable, they intentionally keep the classes small. So only 6% of the classes are over 50. So 94% of them are, are you know, either going to be under 20, under 30, or in the 40s, which is not what you oftentimes get for a, a, a pretty large regional public university. 60, 40, male, female, oh, sorry, female, male. 85% of the students come from Indiana, 2% international, 13% come from around the country, uh, 79% white, 7% black, 6% Latinx, 4% biracial, 1% Asian. Uh, 37% live on campus. Not a big fraternity or sorority school. 15% in frats, 15% in fraternities. Um, interesting approach to admission. They pretty much will make an admissions decision off your transcript, test scores, and GPA. But they don't require essays. They don't require recs. But if you submit them, they'll make them part of the evaluation. And one concern I do have about Ball State is their four- and five-year graduation rate. Their six-year graduation rate is actually above the public school average. Take a guess what the public school average is, Dave, for for six-year grad rate. Oh, I would have to say it's probably around 45%. So the six-year graduation rate is 61% for public okay, and 67% for private. And okay, Ball State's... Pretty- Ball State's at 65.6, so um, higher than the public graduation rate and pretty close to the private rate, but the four- and the five-year rate, something's going on there. The four-year rate is 11%. Whoa, is, what the heck yeah, is that? One in nine people graduate in four years, and uh, 21.9% in the five-year rate. So that's like one in five graduating in five years. Now, a lot of times when you see that, there can be an explanation for it. One of the things that you often find is a lot of non-traditional students that are going part-time, you know, 
25, 28, 34 year olds who have full time jobs and they're going part time and it just takes six years. That may be the explanation. I mean, they've got a healthy six year rate, but that's something I I was unable to unearth in my research is why is the four year rate one in nine and the five year rate one in five? Um, I've been talking with a few people, Dave, you know, including you. Yeah. Um, I want the college spotlights to accurately depict the schools, but I don't want them to just be pure love fests. If I see as something that's concerning, I want to point that out. I've done that occasionally, but not as much as I probably will do going forward. There's a saying that I always said when I would write recommendations for people, and I would say, paint the picture with the warts. You know, like nobody's perfect. So I always, when I wrote a recommendation, I always identified at least one area for improvement. Well, that's a huge area. I mean, effectively, that's making the school 50% more expensive than it's uh, stated. But you have to be careful because you don't know how much of it is part-time. You know, when you see 37% living on campus, that's a strong indication that there's probably um, a fairly large, you know, not necessarily, but it could be a large non-traditional population that you can't expect somebody who's got two kids and a job that takes one or two courses at a time to graduate in four years. So it's something that um, I personally just need to get an answer to, and I'm going to reach out to a Ball State rep or to the school and get some more answers on that. Maybe I'll report back. Yeah, that's a pretty... But other than that, what? any thoughts? Well, that 11% uh, is, is pretty damning. You know, there may be an explanation to that, but until that statistic is explained. I mean, what's the, uh, of the college spotlights that we typically do, what's the average um, for your graduation? I mean, we have a range, you know, Grad- graduation rates highly correlated to selectivity of the school. Yeah. So the school accepts 77% of the applicants. It's also highly correlated to the wealth of the family because people without resources have to work a lot to pay for school and they may be working full time and going on, you know, a lot of people work full time and they're on the six year plan. There's actually more non-traditional students than traditional. Like we have this mindset that you graduate at 18, you go to college, you live on campus for four years, then you graduate. That's actually the minority of people. Okay. The majority of people are non-traditional. And if you're working a full-time job, then it's not realistic for you to expect to graduate in four years. So I'm not judging them yet. I just need to have an explanation. Their six-year rate is is above the national average for pu- public. So something's happening right with six and wrong with four and five. Right. And um, I'll tell you what, I'm going to try to get an answer and come back and let everybody know. And that's our show. A big thank you to you, our listeners, for tuning in this week. Your College Bound Kid is produced by Dave Visaya of PodcastEngineers.com. If you find this podcast helpful, it would help us tremendously if you would subscribe and write us a review on your favorite podcast listening station. And please be sure to click the share button and send this to someone you know that can really use this information. The amazing music that you hear is by Victor Allen Weeks. Our image editor is Tauha Khan. Webmaster is Stallianos Dimitru. And marketing designs are by Kimberly Blass. And if you want to get a copy of the book, 171 Answers to the Most Asked College Admissions Questions, you can go right to 171answers.com. And if you want to have a college coaching session with Mark, you can send him a text to area code 404-664-4340. And if you have a question or a few questions that you would like to ask us, and we'll include them on the show, you can just email us at questions with an S at yourcollegeboundkid.com. Every week, we'll take one question and include it in the episode. We don't like your questions. We love your questions. So send them our way. And by the way, check out our website, yourcollegeboundkid.com. Again, we thank you for tuning in and we look forward to meeting with you again next week.